good evening, everybody. Welcome back to The Nature of Middle-Earth. This is session number, or sorry, to Mythgard Academy. This is session number 23 of The Nature of Middle-Earth. Sorry, I am uh, uh, more late than usual this evening, but as Carrie has already guessed, <laughs> in fact. <clears throat> so I, um, my family just uh, um, got a puppy about a week and a half ago, uh, which has introduced some exciting new adventures to my daily schedule. So uh, there's a little, little uh, adorable, fuzzy little X factor in my scheduling these days. So yeah, just, um, uh, <laughs> just uh, my apologies <clears throat> for that. Um, uh, but it's all good. Pixie is her name and she's adorable. Cecilia, she's a, uh, she's a Shih Tzu, um, a, a little adorable ball of fur. Uh, she's a wonderful little puppy um, and really extraordinarily well behaved for a puppy. But at the end of the day, she's three months old. So anyway, so let us jump straight. I wanna just go straight into the text. Uh, because I want to keep moving forward today, because the one thing which is perfectly obvious is that it is absolutely imperative that we get as far as the dancing bears tonight, because dancing bears, right, of Numenor. So, um, we're, um, uh, we're doing this. <laughs> we're doing this. Um, for those of you who uh, cannot see it, the title of the class tonight is You Do the Rook So Ali and You Turn Yourself Around. Um, uh, so there we go. We're, um, um, I, I am so excited for the dancing bears. Uh, <laughs> so anyhow, let's, let's get there. Um, we had just gotten up to this gorgeous moment where Tolkien explicitly addresses the eagle question. I've mentioned there are a number of different reactions that I've had to different moments in the nature of Middle Earth, right? There are some places I've come to where I've like kind of been fist bumping, you know, fist pumping and being like, oh yeah, that's just, is just exactly what I've, uh, like what I've always, this like confirms what I've always thought, but I didn't have like a specific text to prove, um, like uh, why elves are uh, not vegetarians. Um, answer, because they mostly, uh, some of them are, but uh, mostly they like, you know, um, they don't consider killing plants to eat in order to eat their dead bodies. Any, uh, uh, much better, you know, than eating animals and killing their dead bodies. Um, anyway, but uh, there have been some other passages where I've been, uh, you know, I mean, you've seen me react a couple times and say, like, please don't go there, Tolkien, uh, and all that kind of thing. Uh, like when he was muddying the lines between the incarnation of the Astari and the in incarnation of the rest of the Mire. Um, but um, I'm, uh, this is one where I was like, ready to just like <laughs> fall to my knees <laughs> in gratitude uh, because this is the clearest statement of the thing I've been saying for years in answer to the rather tiresome, why didn't the Eagles just take the ring to Mordor question. Um, and uh, nowhere had he stated this as clearly as this anywhere in his writings. So this was so wonderful, uh, so wonderful to see. Um, anyway, so it is not said that Manwe abandoned them, peoples over whom he had been appointed by Eru to be a vice regent. His messengers could come from Valinor and did so. And though in disguised form and issuing no commands, they intervened in certain desperate events. Um, of course, this is from the Ban of Manwe part, right? Which we discussed last time, and this is the last bit. Um, so exactly, Arthur, that's the point, is that they're, they're clearly an exception to the ban, right? Because the, he hasn't banned the eagles. Um, the eagles are, are 
they're an extension of Manway himself, right? So he's banned anybody else, but he can still, he's not going to, he's not, that doesn't mean he's abandoning the people entirely. He can still send and receive messages from Middle Earth. That's the point of the Eagles, right? That's why they're Eagles, because Manway is not wanting to sever all ties with Middle Earth and the people who live there, right? Um, and of course, this also puts the Eagles and the Astari in a similarly parallel, in a, an, an intriguingly parallel kind of situation, right? Not their role, the role of the Astari is obviously not exactly the same as that of the Eagles, but again, in the context of the ban of Menway here, we have this, uh, you know, these kind of two exemption clauses, right? One, <laughs> two exemption clauses and one uh, escape on a technicality, as we saw from Olmo. You know, Mr. Like, I'm not quite stepping over the line, um, whom I just love. But anyway, okay, footnote. Footnote on certain desperate events. The most notable were those Meyer who took the form of the mighty speaking eagles that we hear of in the legends of the War of the Njoldor against Melkor and who remained in the west of Middle-earth until the fall of Sauron and the dominion of men after which they are not heard of again. Their intervention in the story of Mylor, um, which I suppose is what he, he's changing, is that must be Mythros? And he's changing Mythros's name to Mylor? Anyway, their intervention in the story of Mylor, in the duel of Fingolfin and Melkor, in the rescue of Baron and Luthien is well known. Beyond their knowledge, were the deeds of the elves in the war against Sauron, in the rescue of the Ringfinder and his companions, in the Battle of Five Armies, and in the rescue of the Ring Bearer from the fires of Mount Doom. Okay. Um, so, yes. All right. Uh, notice the beauty of this, right? And I'm, I'm talking about the beauty of this, and again, I'm so personally grateful uh, for the publication of this footnote, um, well, this paragraph and footnote, it, uh, because, again, my, my chief answer to the question, you know, why... Uh, okay, no, my chief answer to the question, why don't the Eagles take the ring to Mordor, is that it's a terrible story, um, and nobody would read it uh, if it... If it you know, if that's what happened. Um, but um, uh, indeed, it would probably not even have been recorded because it wouldn't have been very interesting. Um, but uh, the secondary answer, that's the primary answer. The second answer is that, like, there's a reason the Eagles are not a taxi service. You can't just hire them, right? You can't just go to them and say, hey, can you ferry me about? Um, because they're a really big deal. They're not just animals. They're not just talking animals. They're not, they're not even like really special animals. Um, and so I would then go and I would make some connections and say, talk about like, you know, Saranto, the, uh, you know, the original eagle in the Book of Lost Tales and how explicitly he was one of the Maiar and that implicitly that remains true later on. And then, boom. Here it all is, right? I feel like there should be music <laughs> accompanying this slide. Um, and um, it's just so beautiful. Uh, the explicit statement, but notice, notice the continuity that he is unquestioningly building, right? That the speaking eagles, it's well known, right, the roles that they played. And again, I, I assume Mylor must be Mythros because uh, that's the only one missing, right? The rescue of Mythros and Fingon. Um, the uh, uh, the duel of Fingolfin, right when Fingolfin's body uh, is rescued from um, you know uh, from from Morgoth, and then the rescue of Baron and Luthien, right? Those are you know th three big eagle interventions um, in uh, major stories, and uh, the obvious continuity, right? Like so, the lore masters in question who are writing this, but they don't obviously know what's coming in the Third Age, right? So we're told. Beyond their knowledge were the deeds of the eagles in the war against Sauron. So we just have these trotted out equally to each other. Rescue of Baron and Luthien, uh, the, uh, the rescue of the ring finder and his companions, the, you know, the, the, the rescue of the ring bearer from the fires of Mount Doom. Um, interesting that the rescue of Gandalf is not mentioned, right, uh, explicitly. But, uh, but again, it, it's clear these things are all kind of operating on the same level and are therefore have been made 
explicitly, hmm, I guess still kind of implicitly, but it's right on the border there, uh, to be basically, you know, sort of ordered by Menway, right? I mean, like they, the Eagles, are Maiar who took the form of mighty eagles, right? And they are, they are the most notable messengers come from Valinor, from Manway. Like they're Manway's agents in Middle Earth, um, and one of the things they do is intervene in certain desperate events. Um, and uh, anyway, so that's and now Evil Doctor Can and I agree. It is a better question to ask why the Eagles did intervene in the Hobbit. Um, it's not, I wouldn't say it's jarring, but when you list those events, right, there's just a touch of, like, which of these things is not like the other. But maybe that's not fair. Um, in fact, no, the more I think about it, the more I think it really isn't fair. Okay, so let's back up and look at these things on the whole. Uh, what is the big, the primary pattern? I mean, now that he's conveniently put all of these eagle interventions into one paragraph like this, let's look at the patterns that we see here. We've got, and forgive me, I'm going to keep calling him Mithros because I, I, I'm, I'm just going to keep calling him Mithros. We've got the rescue of Mithros. In the duel of Fingolfin and Melkor, in which the eagles accomplished what? The recovery of Fingolfin's body. Right? I mean, Thorondor does mar Melkor's face, which is like kind of satisfying and cool, but it's not like exactly that, you know, tip the scales in the global struggle or something. The rescue of Baron and Luthien? Okay. That's kind of important, right? Um, the rescue of the ring bearer from the fires of Mount Doom? Well, that was kind, but I don't know about important, right? So I, I guess my, my, um, my point is, if these are the things that we see them doing, why, like, what seems to be the um, remit of the eagles, right? Can we uh, can we fill out a job description for the eagles? Like, what's their what you know what did what did you know these these what job was it that these particular Maiar signed up for that they're undertaking here, right? Um, we get explicitly in the story of Fingon and Mithros, the answering of prayer, right? A, uh, a, a you know, a, a prayer is sent up to Manway to whom all birds are dear and Manway to whom all birds are in fact dear, hears them and the eagle comes and answers the, uh, uh, answers the summons, right? So there, in that story, we see them most explicitly playing this messenger role, this, this, this angelic role. Now, I'm using that word very deliberately here um, because that's what angels are. That's what angels do. Um, you may have heard of, and I know I've talked about this at various points before, um, but many of you will have, may have noticed that Tolkien is uneasy calling the Valar angels, right? Sometimes people want to say that, like, the Valar are basically angels, um, and I, I've said that, too, in other contexts. But I, I feel uncomfortable saying it, and Tolkien was even more uncomfortable saying it, because it's relying upon a misunderstanding. Like, uh, it's like, uh, so, you know what you think angels are? That's what the Valar are, right? But what you think angels are is not actually what angels are, right? I mean, that's th there's a lot of misconceptions about what the word angel means and what angels, as they're described in the Bible, uh, are. Uh, the word angel, both uh, the the original Hebrew word, which I can't remember off the top of my head, and the Greek word, um, it means messenger. Uh, it's it's not just like a spiritual being, right? Um, like this sort of spiritual creature and stuff who's like affiliated with God and whatever. Um, that's not, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of those, right? Angels are one kind of, we've got the, you know, the cherubim and the seraphim, which, and the cherubim have nothing to do with pudgy babies with wings, by the way, the cherubim are completely terrifying. And, um, 
uh, anyway, so you've got all these, there are all these other Elohim, all these other spiritual beings uh, that we see at various points in the prophetic visions and things in the Old Testament. But occasionally angels, the, like God will send messengers, usually like literally with a message, you know, like, uh, you know, hi, uh, you're going to have like a son who's going to be really strong and ill behaved. Right, like to Samson's parents, or uh, hi, you know, you're going to um, beget a child of the Holy Ghost, right, to the Virgin Mary. Um, Malachim, thank you, Arthur. Yes, that's it. Malach, Malach. That was the Hebrew word I was forgetting. I appreciate that. Um, yes, yeah, so so a Malach in uh, the Jewish sense of that, in the you know from the Hebrew Bible, um, it's a messenger. Like they have they have they have a job, um, and their job is. To carry the mail, <laughs> right? They're uh, they're they're not just uh, uh, anyway. Um, so this is why Tolkien hemmed and hawed when you know someone would ask like, "Are the Valar angels?" Like, no, they're not. They're not, they, that's not their job. They don't do that. Are they like? members of the angelic hierarchy as the angelic hierarchy was understood in the Middle Ages? Yes, they are like intelligences. They, they would, uh, uh, the, you know, um, uh, uh, St. Gregory, uh, Gregory the Great would know where to put them, you know, uh, would know how to fit them into his angelic hierarchy. Though later on, of course, he would find out that he was wrong about that. But anyway, that's a different point. Um, but again, that's not what the word angel means, and that's not what angels are. And so Tolkien was always like hedging when people asked him that or when he talked about that. Um, but these, the eagles here, um, the eagles here literally are angels, right? And, 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 and the role that we see them playing um, uh, in the Mithros story in particular is like, that's sort of especially angelic. Um, that that kind of that kind of role, um, he's he's he you know he comes to bring deliverance uh, to uh, convey this you know to he, hearing this intervention uh, this this prayer uh, to Manwe and responding to it. But okay, what do they mostly do? Well, corpse recovery. Corpse recovery is a pretty big trend. Right, um, because of course, as um, as evil Doctor Cannon is pointing out, they do also recover Glorfindel's body. Um, that's another thing. It doesn't get, doesn't make this list here, right? Um, uh, rescuing, um, uh, rescuing folks, rescuing individuals usually. Right? So Baron and Luthien get rescued by the Eagles. Uh, Gandalf gets rescued by the Eagles a couple times, right? Uh, Frodo and Sam get rescued by the eagles. And there's a very close parallel, of course, between the rescue of Baron and Luthien and the rescue of Frodo and Sam, right? Both of them have accomplished the great deed in the dark land and are about to die uh, upon having not quite succeeded in escaping from the dark land, right? So that's where um, both of them are. And then uh, an eagle comes down and swoops in and rescues them. Right, so we've got the retrieval of bodies, we've got the rescue of heroes, especially if they've just been recently dismembered and have achieved a great, uh, a gr achieved a great quest. Um, we've got the rescue of individuals who are imprisoned in high places, like Mithros and Gandalf. Right, notice that there's a, there's like a pairing for almost all of them. Right, um, in almost every case, there's a companion. Right, between Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, and, you know, a third age companion to the first age uh, 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 version. Oh, by the way, notice also how the eagles serve as angels as well, messengers, right, to Numenor, right? Um, they totally are delivering the mail <laughs> to Numenor, aren't they? Uh, but anyway, okay. Um, uh, so, Evil Dr. Cannon, I'm coming back to your point here. My first reaction, like, I think it sounds like, if I'm taking you correctly, it sounds like your first reaction also, well, I won't project onto you. My first reaction when you were pointing that out was that the Battle of Five Armies intervention of the Eagles was un seemed unusual. Like, it doesn't seem to fit all the rest of the patterns. And my first response was, it seems a little random. 
I mean, like, it's not that important, you know? Um, it's not the quest for the Silmaril. It's not the quest for the ring. It's, it's like, why do the eagles care? Why does Menwe care? Who wins the battle of the five, of, of five armies? I mean, like, I'm not saying that, like, it was an awful swell of him to do that, but there are plenty of other battles where good guys die all over the place without eagles swooping in to save the day, right? Why do eagles um, swoop in and save the day uh, at the Battle of Five Armies and not anywhere else, right? So, like, why would they save the Ring Finder and his companions? But anyway, Matt, the more I thought about that, the more I was realizing, actually, it seems to me... So at first I was like, that seems to me like it stands out because it's a lesser, just a less significant moment you know, than the rest of them. But the more I think about it, the more I think the objection actually kind of goes the other way, doesn't it? Um, in every other case that's listed here, they're intervening in the case of individual or very small groups of people, right? Who are themselves in dire need for some reason, right? And or dead, right? Corpse recovery uh, service. Um, but... Um, uh, but in the Battle of Five Armies, we get an intervention to turn the tide of a battle, which was certainly going to be lost otherwise, right? Um, or we seemed like it was certainly going to be lost otherwise. And that's not part of the pattern, right? So at the end of the day, after looking at it carefully, you know, Matt, I decided that uh, um, it doesn't, doesn't violate the pattern in the way that I thought it violates it in the opposite way. But it's still weird. Like at the end of the day, it's still weird. Um, and um, you know, Chad, I can I can certainly see the idea, right, that the Eagles have uh, they only ever intervened after a great unselfish courage and with no regard to one's own well-being. There's certainly a correlation there. Um, but uh, but the problem is that happens a lot. I mean, I'm not saying it's like an everyday... I'm not trying to, you know, downplay the great unselfish courage uh, that happens in those moments and say it's just like garden variety and happens every day. But it does happen on many points when the eagles don't come in and save the day, right? Um, I mean, again, like, you'd think Hurin might have gotten himself an eagle, right? In the fens of Serek, for crying out loud, right? No eagle, right? Even though he got an eagle earlier on, right? Um... Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, now, I mean, there's no question, Matt, that the Eagles and the Hobbit are sort of a bad data point, right? I mean, it's pretty clear that the Eagles and the Hobbit literally are animals, right? They are not. Maiar, who took the form of the mighty speaking eagles, uh, I mean, they're, they're just not, right? I mean, because of the way in which that firewall is still up, you know, the, the, the Hobbit is still, when it was written, a fairy tale based on recycled materials, much of which was being recycled from Tolkien's own legendarium, right? His own, his own unpublished stories, um, uh, which are obviously probably never going to see the light of day at this point, right? Uh, at this point. Remember, he's, uh, you know... Uh, He's old. <laughs> He's like 46, right? Ancient by that time. Um, no, but seriously, like, you know, I, I think it's pretty clear that before The Hobbit was published, his hopes of ever publishing the Silmarillion stuff has gone way down, right? Um, and so... He's telling the Hobbit story, and he's recycling elements. Anyway, so the eagles are clearly recycled from that, but within the context of the eagles themselves, uh, of the eagles themselves, within the Hobbit of the, within the eagles' context within the Hobbit itself is what I mean to say. Um, they're they're animals. They're intelligent animals, right? But they're a bunch of intelligent animals. Uh, you know, there's intelligent wolves and intelligent bears, apparently, as, uh, at least one of which can also turn into a human, unless it's a human who turns into a bear. And there's, um, uh, and there's intelligent spiders, also, right? Um, but anyway, the point is, Matt, he's retconning here, right? And he includes it in the retcon. Notice he doesn't just elide over it. He could do, 
right? He could have just lifted beyond their knowledge were the deeds of the eagles in the war against Sauron. And he could have just jumped in, like, in the rescue of Gandalf from Orthanc, uh, and in the rescue of the Ringbearer from the fires of Mount Doom. Like, he could have just gone there and, like, remained silent on the Hobbit eagles who don't fit in as well. But he didn't do that. He didn't do that. And st if anything, he elaborates on it, right? I mean, in the rescue of the ring finder and his companions in the battle of five armies, um, that's more, that extra prepositional phrase there is more explanation and context that is given than to any of the rest of them. Maybe from the fires of Mountain Doom, kind of. Um, but anyway, he's, he does the opposite of, you know, just kind of drawing the curtain over the Hobbit stuff and saying, don't really look over here. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, Arthur, of course, I was joking because I'm older than Tolkien was at the point that he published The Hobbit. That's why I was calling him ancient at that time. But anyway, um, uh, so, yeah, anyway. So, Matt, there's no question that the Eagles and The Hobbit are different, that he was not, at the time he wrote The Hobbit, thinking of them as Maiar, but, but he's actively retconning it in that direction, right? He is, uh, um, he's being inclusive in his retconning of the eagles here, and I think that's interesting, you know? I think that that's, um, you know, it does take a little bit of, and it can be explained, right? Like, you know, Bilbo, um, Bilbo as, uh, as, you know, Bilbo wrote The Hobbit. There was a lot of, there were a lot of things he didn't really understand, you know, when he wrote The Hobbit. Um, he understand, understands things, comes to understand things much better, right? And therefore Frodo will have had a much better education even before he begins his journey than Bilbo ever had, right? Um, in the lamentable state of comparative uh, ignorance of, you know, elves and the history of the world and all that kind of thing. Um, so, uh, anyhow, yeah. Um, ah, oh, Chris, you are absolutely right. You are absolutely right. I had forgotten that um, I was not counting the uh, um, sing all ye people of the Tower of Guard. Uh, intervention of the eagles, right? Where, once again, of course, Chris, as I think you were implying, um, once again, we see them acting in their angelic role, right? Totally, uh, uh, totally being... What would... Arthur, what's the plural of Malach? God, that's singular, isn't it? Uh, Malachem? Is that what, uh, what that would be? Um, but anyway, um, acting uh, as angels uh, there again. Um... Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's, that's really interesting. I'd never really been Malachim, Malachim, right? Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think that, um, this connection is a really interesting one between angels like actual angels, Malachim, um, from the Hebrew Bible, uh, uh, Angelos, I think, in Greek. Um, that's where the word angel comes from. Uh, and the eagles. But um, I'm pretty convinced of that, actually. The more, the more I think about that, the more that, uh, the more that seems to work. Um, right? Not... All right. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll try to be careful. Malachim, uh, Arthur, if I'm doing it right. Um, really, I'm just, uh, I enjoy the excuse to say him, you know, like do that, that wonderful Hebrew ending is so much fun and I don't get to do it in English. Okay. Anyway, moving on from the Eagles. Okay. Um, delightful little passage, which I figured we should at least glance at, right? This, uh, uh, passage from the cutting room floor, uh, of the two towers the first version of what was going to happen to the horses. So you will remember that in the published version of the text, um, the end, the last event of the evening 
that the rather tense evening that Aragorn and Legolas and Gimli spend on the borders of Fang on the eaves of, in the eaves of Fangorn is the escape of their horses, right? And Gimli believes that the old man that they saw briefly was almost certainly Saruman because he like stole their horses, right? Jerk. And so obviously Saruman. Um, and uh, anyway, so their horses vanished. But of course, we then learn later that no, 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 they just um, they like found out that Shadowfax was nearby and like went off to like hang out with him because obviously social upgrade. But um, uh, that is not the first version, right? What of our horses? Said Legolas. I was forgetting them, said Aragorn, because they're going to go into the forest and want to bring the horses. We cannot lead them into the forest. There will be no food for them in there. They must be set free so that they can return as they will to their own master. We do not know how long our search will take or whither it will lead us. But we do not know yet that but we do not know yet that it will take us into the forest, said Gimli. At least let us take the horses to the edge of the wood. It is a long walk from here to Theoden's halls, and you promised to ride back there with our borrowed mounts. When our quest was over or proved vain, said Aragorn. Let the horses judge, said Legolas. I will speak to them. Running lightly over the grass, he returned to the tree under which they had camped, and going to the horses, he untethered them, fondling their heads and whispering in their ears. Go free now, Hasufel and Arad, he said aloud. Wait for us a while, but no longer than seems good to you. The horses looked solemnly at him for a moment, and then walked together behind the elf towards the riverbank. There they stood quietly, like folk on a doorstep, when friends are taking their leave. As the companions went away up the slope, they lifted their heads and whinnied, and then, bending to the grass, afar they strayed together, browsing peacefully, as if they were in their home pasture. Okay, so this passage is kind of adorable, right? Um, you can see, of course, this is one of many times when Tolkien found himself at kind of a sticky place, right? Where, like, he had to manage these different plot elements, like if they're going to go into the forest, they're not going to take their horses with them, but they can't lose their horses either. And what are, how, how are we going to solve this? Right. So I just, I love the fact that his first impulse is to let the horses judge. Right. Um, and so Legolas is speaking to the horses is of course an element which remains, right. You know, his, uh, um, and how he, uh, calls Arad, his friend, right. Uh, after this Arad, of course, is also, obviously, an elf friend now, at this point. Um, uh, which puts him in fairly elite company, right? Of people who are named elf friends, right? It's a, it's a short list, but Arad on the list, right? Clearly, clearly on the list. Um, but um, anyway, Legolas does not say something. You know, he says, I will speak to them, but he, he's not being all like, I'll talk him into waiting, right? Leave the horses to me or something like that, right? No, he says, let the, let the horses judge. Wait for us for a while, but no longer than seems good to you, right? Use your own equine discretion, right? Arad and Hazavel. Um, uh, <laughs> Alyssa says these horses are obviously exceptional. Uh, hers thinks about 20 seconds is what seems good to him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, there you go. Um, uh, the idea of the sort of um, courtesy that the horses are showing. I mean, I, I, um, I, my sub title for this slide is the courtesy of the pasture is not lessened uh, because of course it's kind of an interesting contrast right we see the the courtesy that the horses show to them and it's explicitly characterized as 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 courtesy as, as like hospitality right that that um, that simile there they stood quietly like folk on a doorstep when friends are taking their leave uh, that's a that's a that's a fun a fun simile isn't it um, they're on the edge of Rohan, right? The realm of Rohan does not extend into Fangorn, really, right? At least they're not going in there. The horses aren't. Um, but the plains, the open grasslands, that's, uh, that's the home of the horses, right? 
So they're going to stand on the threshold, right? Wave as uh, the, you know, two-legged ones go off into the forest, right? Um, so standing quietly, politely. And then they say goodbye, right? They lift up their heads and whinny uh, when, uh, uh, when they move away up the slope. And then they, you know, go about their business hanging out there waiting patiently for, you know, as long as seems good to them. Um, that's... That's really interesting. Now, of course, he's going to replace this with the Shadowfax thing, right? With the as a, a sort of a, a way to introduce them to Shadowfax, um, and also to kind of introduce a little bit more. Um, I mean, I, in the end, I think it was a good call. Uh, I like the published version, but I don't always. But I do like the published version better here. Um, one of the things that we see is we don't get like yet another three-way debate between Legolas and Gimli and Aragorn, right? Um, which kind of also has maneuvered Aragorn into not exactly playing fast and loose with his sworn word to Eomir to return the horses, um, but um, uh, but there's, like, it's sort of, I mean, like, his, when our quest was over or proved vain is kind of like Aragorn showing an impulse to sort of stand on a technicality, which is not an awesome look for him exactly in that moment. Not to mention the fact that we find Aragorn, um, he's the one who's kind of puzzled, right? I was forgetting them. Um, you know, they must be set free. We don't know how long our search will take. Um, anyway, so the choice instead to have the horses run off and apparently abandon them, um, leaving them stranded and in need of help, right? Which makes Gandalf's arrival even, you know, it, it adds like an extra little layer of you catastrophe, right? Um, Gandalf returns and then returns with their horses, in it, thus enabling and empowering them to continue on their journey and do their thing. Um, so again, it's, it's, that, that works very well, right? Um, not to mention as another way of kind of giving us another angle on Shadowfax's awesomeness. So again, I, I, I like the published version, um, but there's definitely something to be said for this, and I'm really glad this got included. Um, yeah. <laughs> Christopher says, I still don't rise to the level of Build a Pony. So true. So true. Hard to beat Build a Pony. Okay. Um, all right. More on lifespans, which is a subject I'm sure you would love to hear a great deal more from Tolkien about. Um, we're not, of course, going back full into the mathematical calculations, and I'm not going to show you any tables or anything like that, um, but uh, we see him returning to this as a story element again, and part of this overall world building, especially in the Numenorean um, context here. The increase of the Numenorean lifespan was brought about by assimilating their life mode to that of the Eldar, up to a limited point. They were, however, expressly warned that they had not become Eldar, but remained mortal men, and had been granted only an extension of the period of their vigor of mind and body. Thus, as the Eldar, they grew at much the same rate as ordinary men. Gestation, infancy, childhood, and adolescence, up to puberty and full growth, proceeded more or less as before, but when they had achieved full growth, they then aged or wore out very much slower, so that for them five years had about the same effect as one year for ordinary mortals. The first approach of world weariness was indeed for them a sign that their period of vigor was nearing its end. When it came to an end, if they persisted in living, then decay would, as growth had done, soon proceed at more or less the same rate as for other men. Thus, if a Numenorean reached the, age, the end of vigor at about 400 years, he would then pass quickly in about 10 years from health and vigor of mind to decrepitude and senility. Okay, you see what he's doing here? This is not, and again, just in case, like, anyone is having any PTSD flashbacks for all the math in section one, um, again, we're not thinking in those same terms again, but what he's doing here is thinking through the implications of that, right? So he's already done all his math. He's done all his math, and he's working all this stuff out, and he's figuring, okay, um, 
the ratios of Numenorean age to other to other men's age and stuff. And so having thought it through now in the ways that he's thought it through, he's realized he he's realized it more. Like he's made it more real. It's one thing just to say in a genealogy, right? Just to say in, in like Appendix B, right? Um, that this Numenorean king lived for like, you know, ruled for like 400 years or whatever. Um, you can say that, right? But you can say that, and he seems to have said that, without really thinking through the question of, yeah, but what did that look like, right? Um, are their whole lives lived in proportion, right? Are Numenoreans teenagers for 50 years? Ugh, right? That'd be awful. Um, is that what happened, right? Does it take a Numenorean like six years to, you know, learn to like walk and feed themselves with a spoon? Like seriously, like is that, is, is that what happens? And if not, okay, then not. So what he decides is that the Numenorean growth pattern is parallel to the, because remember he already did this with elves, right? He already had this conversation with himself when he was thinking about elf, elf growth. And this, among other reasons, is one of the reasons why he had decided on this variability thing, right? Like the, the, the rate of growth during their childhood and right for those first 20 years or whatever. And then, uh, um, uh, and then he, then they slow down. And so he's decided the Numenorians must follow the same pattern. But notice, notice what happens, right? He is now, having made that decision, having thought it through on that level, he's now realizing, huh, look what's happened. Now, it turns out, he, he discovers something here, I think, right? And what he, sounds to me, has discovered is that when the Valar bestow longer life on the Numenorians, they're not just keeping them within their human framework and just making them live longer, right? The implications of extending their life is making them more like the Eldar, right? To some extent, giving them a longer lifespan was always, to some extent, blurring the lines between the two kindreds, elves and men, right? But this makes it much more... Um, this makes it much more clear, right? The blurring of that line is, is, is much stronger, right? Um, and he's going to say a similar thing. Let me actually... Mm, wait a second. Is that... No, I guess that is the one that I wanted. No, it isn't. This is the one I wanted. Sorry, I'm gonna, I wanted to jump ahead. I didn't order these properly. Um, because there's a similar passage in chapter 12 that I wanted to touch on in the context of this. The long life of the Numenorians was in answer to the actual prayers of the Adain and Elros. Manwe warned them of its perils. They asked to have more or less the lifespan of old because they wanted to learn more. As Arendis said later, they became a kind of imitation elves, and their men had so much in their heads and desire of, and desire of doing that they ever felt the pressure of time and so seldom rested or rejoiced in the present. Fortunately, their wives were cool and busy, but Numenor was no place for great love. Okay, so this is horrendous. We're getting this from, right? Which means it's one side of a story, right? Um, Numenor was no place for great love. Very interesting. Um, they became a kind of imitation elves. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly... That's exactly what we see, right? It's exactly what conclusion he seems to be almost forced to. In other words, doesn't it seem, and we talked about this before, doesn't it begin to seem even more and more what a bad idea the lengthening of the years of the Numenorians was, right? That the mixed messages that are being given to the Numenorians, warned they may have been, right? Warned of its perils. Um, but saying we're going to institute the ban 
you can't come to Eldemar. You can't come to uh, to to. You can't come to Elvenholm. You can't come to Valinor, um, because uh, you know this is that's not for mortals, right? That's only for elves. But also, we're gonna kind of turn you into, you know, a poor man's elf, right? We're gonna we're gonna turn you into pseudo elves, right? Um, uh, but you can't. You still can't come to Valinor, right? Um, we're maintaining the wall between the kindreds, except we're kind of eroding the wall between the kindreds at the same time. I mean, it's um, it's not at all um, consistent, right? That message, and it really just seems to make that more and more, um, uh, more and more. Problematic, right? The choice to prolong their lives in the first place. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, now, Captain Button, I'm not sure about hobbits. Hobbits aren't considered of age until 33. Is that related to slower physical maturity or just conservative social custom? It. They talk about emotional maturity, right? I mean, think about Mary saying something like, and I was only in my teens, right? Um, but I don't get the impression that Hobbit children, you know, take 50% more time. You know, again, like they don't walk until they're, you know, 18 to 24 months old or something like that. Like, I don't get the impression that it, it's, you know, you take all the developmental milestones and you add 50%, you know, all the way down the road. Like, I don't get the impression that that's the case. It does seem to me to be a little bit more social custom. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I, hobbits aren't of age and aren't considered of age until age 33, Captain Button, sounds to me kind of like... Uh, kind of like the equivalent of saying um, you know, you can't rent a car until you're 25. <laughs> sort of, right? Um, that is, it's not about their physical maturity. It's about uh, um, you know, the culture's assessment of when they're uh, you know, when they're mature. Yeah, a cultural milestone, evil Dr. Cannon, exactly. That 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 kind of thing. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, I just, I thought that it was, especially in light of all of the, you know, when we were looking back in part one, when we're looking at all of those mathematical, you know, all the tables and all the mathematical calculations, um, and I was talking about how, like, the implications of those things, right? What were these pictures that Tolkien was getting? This, I think, is a really fascinating, possibly unintended consequence of doing that kind of world building, right? When you ask those questions, when you really think it through, you find answers you weren't necessarily expecting, right? And I think that's totally, um, that's totally what happened uh, to, uh, to Tolkien here. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not sure what to make of the statement, but Numenor was no place for great love. I think... I think my inclination is to say that that's a kind of red flag, basically. Um, I think. Now, love stories... Yeah, I don't know. But I, I think it's a red flag. I think that the disjunction, which Arendus knows a great deal about, uh, between men and women in Numenor, um, is a bad sign. And of course, Aldarion and Arendis is well before the decline of Numenor, right? Um, we are nowhere near turning against the Valar yet. But already, 
um, the men and women of Numenor are growing apart, right? It's not a place for great love. I think that has to be. I think that has to be a bad sign. I think it has to be a bad sign. Um, again, kind of a red flag or maybe a yellow flag. Um, this is uh, not trending in the right in the right direction. Um, again, they're like the Eldar, but they're not the Eldar. It's one thing for an elf husband and wife to sort of grow apart in the way that they some you know take interest in other things, right? Um, but elves are designed for this kind of thing, right? The time of the children and their, you know, the bond between them going on as it can do for, you know, they can afford, they have, even though the Numenorean's time frame is longer, it's still nothing compared to the Elvish time frame, right? Um, so it's one thing for two, uh, for elf, two elf spouses, right, to be off doing different things, right? Pursuing different things, but their bond together can remain and can be renewed after you know, a millennium or so, right? But uh, not so humans, right? And so again, this seems to be another way to me in which we seem to see a negative implication, a negative uh, consequence of them being pseudo-elves, essentially. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Anyway, so sorry, I jumped ahead. Let me jump back a little bit. Okay, here we go. Um, more on fallenness, that is, thinking about the fall of man. Now, this is something we've been talking about quite a bit, off and on, throughout the book, right? It keeps coming up. Um, and so um, I've been increasingly glad. You may remember I was apologizing the first time this came up, and I was like, not really sure I should be spending all this time talking about, you know, the doctrine of the fall of man and original sin and all that kind of thing. Well, I'm super glad I did now because uh, it keeps coming up, right? So I'm glad we can just allude back to it here. Numenorians were strictly monogamous by law and by their tradition. That is, by the tradition of the original Edain concerning conduct, afterwards reinforced by elder in example in teaching. There were in the early centuries few cases of the breach of the law or even the des of desire to break it. The Numenorians or Dunedain were still in our terms fallen men, but they were descendants of ancestors who were in general wholly repentant, detesting all the corruptions of the shadow, and they were specially graced. In general, they had little inclination to and a conscious detestation of lust, greed, hate, and cruelty, and, ty and tyranny. Not all, of course, were so noble. There were such things as wickedness among them, at first very rarely to be seen, for they were not selected by any test save that of belonging to the three houses of the Edain. Like, you didn't, you didn't have to have, like, a morality screening before they let you into Numenor. Among them were no doubt a few of the wild men and renegades of old days, and possibly, though this cannot be asserted, actual conscious servants of the enemy. So there might have been some, uh, there might have been some impostors among them turns out. Um, okay, so we've been talking before about how the elves are not fallen in the same way, it seems, that humans were, right? Um, they, it seems quite possible for an elf just to be like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm good. Right, I'm 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 going to be a good person, capital G, capital P. Right, I'm not going to sin. Um, now we see plenty of examples of elves choosing another way. Right, um, uh, of course, like everybody's favorite son of Finway. But um, uh, so they obviously were capable of sin and of wrong desires and things. But it was clearly easier for them just it was easier for them just to kind of steer clear of those and remain un, remain not sinful, essentially. That's what we keep seeing about the elves. So what happens to the Numenorians? Well, the Numenorians also, they were still in our terms fallen men, 
he says. They were still, in our terms, fallen men. And by our terms, I think he means Christian terms, right? Um, there was still original sin in the Numenorians. They were not innocent. They were not perfect. But they tended to be much more virtuous than we are, right? They were like moral giants compared to us. How? Why? Well, they started off with ancestors who were wholly repentant, detesting all the corruption of the shadow, and they're specially graced. It's part of the blessing of the Valar that they were blessed with little inclination to and a conscious detestation of lust, greed, hate, and cruelty, and tyranny. That's how they started. Specially graced to have little inclination in those directions, right? So those inclinations, which as fallen humans, they all experienced, um, but they were given special grace. Their inclination towards those things was decreased. In other words, again, they're made kind of like elves, but not entirely. Right? This totally sounds to me like another pseudo-elf situation, right? Where they are being made more like unto the Eldar without being actually made into Eldar, just as their lifespans and life patterns even are very like the life patterns of the Eldar, but not exactly the same, because they're still human and they're still mortal, right? Um, and they are specially graced to be virtuous, inclined to virtue, like the elves, and yet not, still remaining fallen, right? They remain mortal, they remain fallen. Um, there is, in a sense, a, a kind of um, uh, masking, almost, if that makes sense. Um, uh, masking of their of their both of their fallenness and of their mortality. And I'm not sure that either one of those things is at the end of the day a good thing. Um, and again, I'm wondering if the I'm wondering if the marital problems that were being pointed at is not something like a, a corollary to this um, this uh, particular gracing as well, special gracing as well. Um, okay. Um, much more on Numenorean animals. Let's finally get to the Numenorean animals already. Though the Numenorians used horses for journeys and for the delight of riding, they had little interest in racing them as a test of speed. In country sports, displays of agility, both of horse and rider, were to be seen, but more esteemed were exhibitions of understanding between master and beast. The Numenorians trained their horses to hear and understand calls by voice or whistling from great distances, and also where there was great love between men or women and their favorite steeds, they could or so it is said in ancient tales, summon them at need by their thought alone. Um, I absolutely love the idea of, like, equine exhibitions involving, like, you know, like, and now the complex telepathy uh, competition. Um, that's really fun. So it was also with their dogs. For the Numenorians kept dogs especially in the country, partly by ancestral tradition, since they had few useful purposes any longer. The Numenorians did not hunt for sport or food, and they had only in a few places upon the borders of wild lands any great need of watchdogs. In the sheep-rearing regions, such as that of Amerie, they had dogs specially trained to help the shepherds. In the earlier centuries, countrymen also had dogs trained to assist in warding off or tracking down predatory beasts and birds, which to the Numenorians was only an occasional necessary labor and not an amusement. Dogs were seldom seen in the towns. In the farms they were never chained or tethered, but neither did they dwell in the houses of men, for they were often 
though they were often welcomed, to the central solma or hall where the chief fire burned, especially the old faithful dogs of long service, or at times the puppies. It was men rather than women who had a liking to keep dogs as friends. Women loved more the wild or unowned birds and beasts, and they were especially fond of squirrels, of which there were great numbers in the wooded country. I have very little idea what to say about this, apart from the fact that it's just kind of awesome. Um, but notice, like, look at the patterns here. What we learn about Numenorean society from how they relate to animals. Right? On the one hand, you have the memory of the ancient days. Right? The memory of the ancient days. So, like, they keep dogs. And their keeping of dogs is a recollection of the time when dogs were useful, right? When dogs were necessary as guard dogs, as hunting dogs, um, you know, dogs in a, uh, you know, more sort of primitive society can be absolutely essential um, for survival. Um, and, um, but they're not essential. They're totally inessential for survival in Numenor. Right, um, there's they, they're a little bit useful, right? Sheep dogs, a little bit useful in the sheep area, but it's just uh, it's just not really they're just not really necessary. Even horses, it seems, um, uh, even horses, it seems, are um, almost a similar kind of memory. I mean, they do use horses for journeys. Right. So, I mean, Numenor is a fairly big island, so they do sometimes have to go long journeys and they use horses for that. Um, but even that, it seems, is sort of less essential here than it would have been back in Middle Earth. Um, it's more, you know, they seem to be more interested in training their horses, um, like for fun, you know, in, in like building their relationship with their horses as clearly they do uh, with their dogs, right? And apparently they're squirrels as well. Um, I have two responses to the squirrel thing. One um, is... Um, One is I, I'm tempted to ask it, how many squirrels Tolkien had actually met. Um, but then I immediately correct that with the thought, no, no, this is an ideal of squirrel of which our modern squirrels are only, you know, fallen examples. Um, I, yeah, I... I um, So I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to cast any aspersions on Numenorean squirrels, uh, based on, uh, um, my own experience with squirrels. Um, exactly. They're platonic ideal squirrels, Captain Button. That's exactly it. Now, Alyssa, I was thinking about the same thing. Um, the way that gendering is working here, that is women loving the wild birds and beasts, which is the opposite of what we see among incident wives, as Alyssa points out. And I agree with that. Though, Alyssa, I would also say it maps onto Eldarion and Arendis also, doesn't it, though? Right? It's Arendis who loves the wild woods, and um, it's Eldarion who wants to make tree farms, right, for his own uses, and um, he seems not even to understand when Arendis is like, I love the trees, and you're all about foresting, or you're, you're, you're all about lumber, right? Um, you cut down all these trees for lumber to make ships, and I love trees, and that's not okay with me, right? And Aldarion's response is like, but I plant more trees than I cut. Where, wherein enters the problem, right? Um, uh, yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, so that seems to be another Numenorian pattern, Alyssa. I think I would say, um, and that it seems to be genuinely and deliberately different from the ent and ent wife thing, um, which is really, really interesting, um, really cool to see. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, is it a reflection of Aule and Yavanna? Um, uh, Jenna Artanis says, maybe. I mean, certainly, and yet they will have need of wood, right? Um, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, the wild country, right? The wild beasts and plants, um, there is, there lies a feminine figure behind those things, right? Ultimately, in Yavanna. Um, so, I think that's certainly, um, I think that's certainly important, right? I think, I think that's certainly, that seems significant. Um, someone was asking if the squirrels are replacements for cats. Um, well, yes, because apparently, uh, although squirrels are apparently not annoying and destructive in Numenor, um, in Numenor, it turns out cats still evil. Uh, is uh, what we what we learn. Um, as for the major animals, it is clear that there were none of the canine or related kinds. So now remember that um, the uh, this is his description of the wild fauna of Numenor, right? Um, the 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 native Numenorean fauna, right? And um, uh, so there were no dogs native to Numenor. They brought the dogs with them. They brought dogs and horses with them and sheep. Okay, so as for the major animals, it is clear that there were none of the canine or related kinds. There were certainly no hounds or dogs, all of which were imported. There were no wolves. There were wild cats, the most hostile and untamable of the animals. Sorry, I just feel like that's like a... probably a bad t-shirt idea. Cats, the most hostile and untamable of the animals. Citation, J.R.R. Tolkien. But no large felines, so they didn't have, like, lions and such. There were a great number, however, of foxes, or related animals. Their chief food seems to have been animals which the Numenorians called Lopaldi. These existed in large numbers and multiplied swiftly, and were voracious herbivores, so that the foxes were esteemed as the best and most natural way of keeping them in order, and foxes were seldom hunted or molested. In return, or because their food supply was otherwise abundant, the foxes seem never to have acquired the habit of preying upon the domestic fowl of the Numenorians. The Lopoldi would appear to have been rabbits, animals which had been quite unknown before in the northwestern regions of Middle-earth. The Numenorians did not esteem them as food, and were content to leave them to the foxes. Um, all right, so um, there you go. Obviously, El Herrera was from Numenor, right? Uh, and that's where rabbit, that's where rabbitry began. And from then they were, uh, I don't know how they got back to Middle Earth, um, but I think there must have been a, a, a f floating hutch at the time when the island sank uh, that brought them through. I think that's the story. Uh, there's, a, there's an El Herrera story about that. Um, but, uh, yeah, delighted to learn that rabbits are not only native to Numenor, but unique to Numenor, right? Um, there was, there was, they're, they're unique to Numenor. Now, obviously, I guess they, they could have been brought over by the Numenorean sailors at some point. I don't know why they would have, since the Numenoreans didn't esteem them as food and were content to leave them to the foxes, um, like, and occasionally take them on voyages with them would be a weird thing to do. But, um, 
but anyway, yeah. So, Katriana, I think, uh, yes. Yes, I think that um, uh, the talking fox in the Shire is clearly a Numenorean stowaway, right? I think that the uh, it was one of the, the great um, wise and long-lived foxes of Numenor uh, who has survived uh, and uh, is, um, uh, yeah, is one of the, uh, um, I don't know, I don't know what the Numenorean, what the, like the, the Cinderin for fox would be. So I don't know how to say fox of the West, you know, like Dunedain is, is, is man of the West. Um, but, uh, but yeah, yeah, uh, clearly. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, so obviously the only totally antisocial, uh, member of society, which is just like of the animal kingdom, that's barely even worth a sentence cats. Right. Most hostile and untamable of all the animals and like pretty much irrelevant, therefore, to everything in Numenor. We can tame squirrels, but you can't tame cats, man. Nobody can tame cats. Right. Um, squirrels, yes. Cats, no. Um, sorry. <laughs> Tolkien, just a dog guy. Sorry. Uh, you know what to say. You're right. Devora says that um, clearly Ella Herrera tricked uh, some of the Numenorean sailors into bringing rabbits along with them. Yeah, yeah, right. No, there, there, there must have been a trick uh, to escape from Numenor, like the story of El Herrera and the escape from the downfall of Numenor. I look forward to that story, right? Yeah, that seems, uh, that seems, that seems right. Um, and of course, I hope that all of you cat lovers out there know that I'm just teasing you, right? I am, I am just teasing you. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, I mean, I, I am, I am not a cat person myself. My family's deadly allergic to cats. Uh, so we don't do cats, but, um, uh, it is, <laughs> T Tolkien is so shamelessly biased against cats in almost all of his writing. Um, <laughs> that it's just, it kind of, it never, I, I, I never cease to find it funny. Anyway, um, <laughs> right. Uh, meow indeed says anyone who has met a cat knows that this is truth. Uh, and I'm a cat person. What, what that cats are the most hostile and untamable of all the animals. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I yeah, I hear that. Um, okay. Oh, so Rusko. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. We got it. So, um, uh, Rusko would be, um, Fox. So, um, okay. I don't know how, how it would be like Dun Rusko doesn't quite seem right, but anyway, yeah, that fo the thinking fox, uh, in the fellowship of the ring is probably, uh, you know, like the last in an unbroken line of, uh, descendants from Numenorean foxes, um, uh, that, uh, I think that's, I think that, that tracks for me. And now the dancing bears, right? Um, this might be the best paragraph in the entire book. I'm not 100% sure about that, but uh, I think this might be the best paragraph in the whole book. There were bears in considerable numbers in the mountainous or rocky parts, both of a black and brown variety. The great black bears were found mostly in the forestar. The relations of the bears and men were strange. From the first, the bears exhibited friendship and curiosity towards the newcomers, and these feelings were returned. At no time was there any hostility between men and bears, though at mating times and during the first youth of their cubs they could be angry and dangerous if disturbed. I mean, as, who wouldn't be? The Numenorians did not disturb them except by mischance. I would hope not. Very few Numenorians were ever killed by bears, and these mishaps were not regarded as reasons for war upon the whole race. Many of the bears were quite tame. They never dwelt in or near the homes of men, but they would often visit them in the casual manner of one householder calling upon another. I feel very much the same about our local bear. Um, we have a bear who lives nearby um, and often comes to call upon us, normally to avail himself of our raspberry bushes. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, he just kind of saunters in. He's like, sup, um, saunters back out again. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, Householder calling upon another. At such times, they were often offered honey to their delight. I must confess, I have neglected to offer honey to our local bear. Um, only an occasional bad bear ever raided the tame hives. Most strange of all 
where the bear dances. The bears, the black bears especially, had curious dances of their own, but these seem to have become improved and elaborated by the instruction of men. At times the bears would perform dances for the entertainment of their human friends. The most famous was the great bear dance, Roxoale, of the Tempole, of the Tompole in the Forestar, to which every year in the autumn many would come from all parts of the island, I bet they would, since it occurred not long after the Eru Hantale, at which a great concourse was assembled. To those not accustomed to the bears, the slow but dignified motions of the bears, sometimes as many as fifty or more together, appeared astonishing and comic. But it was understood by all admitted to the spectacle that there should be no open laughter. The laughter of men was a sound that the bears could not understand. It alarmed and angered them. Wow. Wow. Now, first let me address the most serious literary issue here, because this is kind of awesome, right? Um, several of you, I'm sure, and yeah, I can see Chad was certainly thinking about The Hobbit, right? He's not getting this from nowhere. Now, I'm not saying he's just getting this from The Hobbit. Uh, I mean, presumably we got it somewhere when he did when he wrote The Hobbit in the first place. But um, the description of the dancing bears, Bjorn, what does Bjorn do by night? Why should you not go outside? Why is it very very dangerous to go outside of? Um, of his house at night because you'll interrupt the bear dance party which is going on at Bjorn's house, right? Um, I mean, there is like, well, I'd say like a bear, you know, the bear like a bear rave or something like that, but that doesn't seem quite right for the slow and dignified motions of the bears. Um, but every night, the bears come to Bjorn's house. It's the Ruxoale every night at Bjorn's house, right? Um, there has been a Ruxoale revival like nobody's business at the house of Bjorn, right? Um, but of course, notice... A contrast. Whereas in Numenor, people quite understandably travel from all over the island to come and witness this, right? In The Hobbit, they're forbidden, right? Bilbo has a, like a dream vision of the dancing bears with their slow, dignified movements, right? Um, the slow, shambling dances of the bears. Again, it's, it's, it's the same thing. They're doing totally doing the same dance at Bjorn's house. Right, but there it's dangerous. You're not allowed to see it, right? It's like they have to kill you <laughs> if you witness the bears dancing, right, uh, at Bjorn's house. Um, but what is really fascinating about the connection? between the Numenorean bear dances and the Bjorning bear dances is we already were looking at an example of Tolkien retconning the Hobbit into his world, right? Um, making the choice to not just kind of pass over it in silence, but, but bring it in, right? This is further than that, right? Further than that. Um, this is, um, um, it's, this is not just him taking an element, a, a moment, like a, a plot point, right, from The Hobbit and incorporating it into a larger pattern in the overall legendarium, like he was with the eagle appearance at the, at the Battle of Five Armies. Here, he's taking 
a frankly curious and peculiar moment from The Hobbit. One of those, like, kind of weird idiosyncrasies, which you'd think might get downplayed when The Hobbit gets placed into the context of the larger re- legendary man. I mean, I can easily imagine him being like, okay, list of things to um, say less about, right, uh, from now on, uh, in, in order to complete the naturalization of The Hobbit. Uh, uh, stone giants, uh, kicking people like footballs. Uh, let's not talk about that so much. Maybe fewer references to express trains. We'll try in the future to cut back on that, but no promises. And, um, uh, oh, bear dances. Yeah, bear dances. That's uh, maybe may, maybe no dancing bears. I could easily. I, I might have nominated the dancing bears, right, uh, for inclusion in that list. Not only has he declined to include the dancing bears on that list. He has, like, doubled down on the dancing bears, right? He has given the dancing bears Numenorean roots. He has made uh, the... Again, he has made Bjorn's house into a revival of an ancient thing. In fact, I can't help but wonder if he's giving some kind of hint at Bjorn's own ancestry. Who is Bjorn? How does he get to be a skin changer? We never learned this, right? But who was Bjorn? How could he do what he does? How did that come to be? Right? Well, now we have Numenor in the picture. Is Bjorn of Numenorian ancestry? Well, he is very tall. Right? Is there some kind of magic? Right? So I don't know. Like, I don't know. But um, doesn't it feel like we have um, not exactly the beginnings of a story, but like uh, the door frame, right? And the, 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 the threshold, right? Through which one could pass in order to develop the story of Bjorn's history. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a fascinating choice to make the bear dancing a sign. Because notice, what is it a sign of? What's the significance of the bear dance? The significance of the bear dance is the closeness between, like, the the bears, this long paragraph on bears, which is, I think, the longest paragraph we get on anything, um, even squirrels. Um, this paragraph on bears shows us, I'm tempted to say something like the peak, the pinnacle of human-animal relations in Numenor. Um... Inasmuch as Numenor is sort of like the high watermark of human civilization, and this, the, their relationship with bears seems to be the place where the relationship is most mutual, right? In the casual manner of one householder calling upon another, right? They, um, um, to hunt bears is the, the idea of hunting bears is characterized as war upon the whole race, right? You don't, you don't hunt bears. You go to war with them. Or, much preferably, choose not to go to war with the bears, right? Um, by the way, I've, I attempted to maintain that same policy myself up here in New Hampshire. I, uh, we, we, uh, this is why, why we have no low-hanging bird feeders at our house, so as not... Uh, to necessitate any war with the bears. Um, But um, anyway, the relationship here, right? The relationship of uh, mutual respect, friendship and curiosity, right? Um, The bears welcomed 
the, their new human neighbors with friendship and curiosity. There's no hostility between them, right? Um, no war was ever declared. Uh, they never dwelt in or near the homes of men, but they would often visit in a casual way. Um, a bear that raids beehives, cultivated beehives, is a bad bear. That's a not. It's a deviant bear. That bear is probably gonna like, you know, be disciplined by the other bears, right? Um, but you know, it's unusual. And then we have the bear dances. And again, notice the phrasing. Um, uh, where was it? Uh, At times, the bears would perform dances for the entertainment of their human friends. So, like, the bears are, like, rehearsing all year for the big dance show, right? It's a public display for the benefit of humans. Like, they know full well that the humans are gathering from all over the island to come watch the great bear dance, right? And um, and so the bears are like, this year we're putting on a specially great show, right? I mean, that's... that's um, that's kind of that's kind of amazing, right? Um, again, I'm coming back to this because again, this just this paragraph has Bjorn's fingerprints all over it in my mind, right? Um, I feel very confident that we are hearing here the distant echoes of Bjorn's origin story, um, in some sense or other, right? Um, and even that, it makes me think of, again, here's another thing. On my list of uh, things maybe you tone down in order to integrate the uh, Hobbit into the Legendarium more perfectly, maybe, uh, maybe not dogs walking on their hind legs, carrying trays of food. Maybe, maybe, I mean, it's fun and everything, right? But maybe, maybe we don't go there. Right. Just like also talking spiders also on my list. Right. Of things maybe we don't do if we're going to integrate it perfectly uh, into into the, the world of the Lord of the Rings and the Silmarillion. Um, but notice what he's done. Is he backing down from that? No, no. Could you see Numenorians training their dogs to carry food on trays? Totally. Totally. Would their sheep do that? Yeah. Of course they would. Their horses? Sure. Yeah. And you can communicate with them telepathically, too. Right? Um, I mean, I think that's why I say not only this paragraph, but I think even really much of this section has Bjorn's fingerprints on it. And one of the consequences, it seems to me, of this paragraph and of other uh, you know this, this, these other elements, is to suggest there's really, there's really just the one place in Middle Earth where we see a glimpse of how humans and animals kind of lived together in Numenor, and that's at the house of Bjorn, right? It now becomes this amazing kind of, you know, throwback enclave, right? And that's really interesting. That's really interesting to me. Um, and yet, it's still Middle Earth now, right? Um, if you see the bears dancing by night, the danger isn't that you might laugh at them and alarm them. The danger is that they might rip you to pieces. It's not safe, right? And you better stay inside. Anyway, I think that's... Uh, um, I think that's really fascinating. Um, okay, anyway. Um, let's keep going. One more. The legends of the foundation of Numenor often speak as if all the Adain that accepted the gift set sail at one time and in one fleet. Of course, the beginning of the Akalabeth absolutely sounds like that, doesn't it? But this is only due to the brevity of the narrative. 
In more detailed histories, it is related, as might be deduced from the events and the numbers concerned, that after the first expedition, led by Elros, many other ships, alone or in small fleets, came west bearing others of the Adine, either those who were at first reluctant to dare the great sea but could not endure to be parted from those who had gone, or some who were far scattered and could not be assembled to go with the first sailing. Since the boats that were used were of elvish model, fleet but small, and each steered and captained by one of the Eldar deputed by Círdan, it would have taken a great navy to transport all the people and goods that were eventually brought from the north to Numenor. The legends make no guess at the numbers, and the histories say little. The fleet of Elros is said to have contained many ships, according to some 150 vessels, to others two or three hundred, and to have brought thousands of the men, women, and children of the Adine, probably between 5,000 or at the most 10,000. But the whole process of migration appears in fact to have occupied at least 50 years, possibly longer, and finally ended only when Círdan, no doubt instructed by the Valar, would provide no more ships or guides. Right? Círdan cuts them off after a while. Um, now, after part one, you, you can hear this, right? You can feel exactly where Tolkien is here. Right? Can you, can you sense the math in the background? Right? Um, can you hear another one of those Tolkienian algebra word problems being set up? Right? Um, if between five and ten thousand Numenorians were transported in uh, elvish ships that could only hold X number of people, and they only made this number of trips, and they had to bring this money, how many trips would it take, and over how long? Right? You can, you can hear it all in the background. Right, you can hear him. You can hear him doing all of this calculating, right? Um, you can hear him doing all of this calculating. Just this is another example. This is one of the most explicit examples, I think, of him pointing to the shift in narrative mode, right? The legends of the foundation of Numenor like the ones we've read, like the ones that got published eventually, often speak as if all the Adine that is sail at one time. Of course it does, right? That's how legends operate. The legends aren't interested in the logistics, right? The legends are not trying to give us the experience of, like, what would you see and hear and think and feel if you were there in the moment, right? Um, what you would see... And here would be long lines of people with livestock, right, waiting and like somebody arguing and like the elvish captain smiling with a somewhat strained smile as this guy brings his herd of pigs onto the boat, right, uh, in order to go over to Numenor. Um, this is, um, uh, this is what you would have actually seen, right, if you'd been there, but this is not the version of the sailing to Numenor that the legends give us, right? When he's writing the Akalabeth, the Silmarillion as a whole, right? That's, those are legends. Those are legends. The Hobbit's a fairy tale. The Lord of the Rings, that's a, a historical romance, right? Um, so, remember, that's what we've been doing this whole time, right? That's what he's doing from after he finishes the Lord of the Rings until the time of his death, right? Preparing to convert the Silmarillion into a historical romance. And so he's done the math. He's working it out, right? It was at least 50 years. At least 50 years it took uh, for all of the Adine who were going to make it uh, to, uh, to be brought over, right, to Numenor. Um, this... Um, this kind of um, um, this kind of thinking, uh, this sort of translation uh, from one genre to another, is so typical of this time period. Um, it's not for everybody. Many of us like the legends, prefer the legends, right? But he's made his choice. That's not where he wants to live, right? He wrote The Lord of the Rings, and now he's gone habitual. Uh, and that's the kind of narrative that he wants to write now. It's kind of fascinating. All right. Um, I'm going to stop now. But let's see. We did pretty well. We got through 
I think all, we got we got through all of chapter 13, didn't we? Yes, we did. Next, we're on to the mushrooms chapter. So, okay. We got through chapter 13, which is pretty good. Um, so let's do... Um, let's read through 17. Just in case. Oh, um, we're going to probably continue doing this thing where... We don't quite get up to where I assign, and then we keep going. But this way, you know, you're prepared and have time to review. Um, so let's um, let's go up through 17. That's what I said, right? 17. I'm pretty sure that's what I said. 17. Yeah. Um, through the uh, Sylvan Elves and Sylvan Elvish chapter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so maybe we'll get to Galadriel and Celeborn next time, right? Uh, if we. Uh, if we if we do pretty well awesome thank you guys for joining me tonight this was a lot of fun we we, we talked about the dancing bears just um i don't know how far down my list dancing bears would have been if i'd been asked to guess about the things that tolkien was going to reveal to us in the nature of middle earth right um but i am i, I am so glad that it happened despite the fact that i would never have predicted it Thanks very much, everybody. Good night, and uh, I will see you guys next week. Don't forget, Sunshine Moot is coming up this weekend, Sunshine Moot. Uh, so you can still join us. Go to signumuniversity.org slash events, uh, and you can sign up to join us at Sunshine Moot down in Orlando. Looking forward to seeing folks there and uh, hanging out with folks, and uh, I'll be back next week. Thanks, everybody. Night now.